I would like to invite our uh, next uh, presenter, our first uh, technical presenter, Mr. Stefan Jensen, who is the managing director of the Scantec Refrigeration Technologies. He is a known expert in the field of industrial refrigeration with uh, focus on low charge direct extension ammonia. So, Devin, uh, Devin uh, Stefan, please uh, join us if you can hear us. Hopefully, we will see you in, a, in the camera very soon. Uh, we have known Stefan for many years. He is regularly attending academic conferences around the world and presenting at different, uh, different uh, uh, conferences about the topic, about the energy consumption and best practices. So we are very happy to have Stefan today as a, a true expert. Stefan, uh, I can see you joining today. Uh, we have just introduced you uh, briefly. So uh, this is uh, the time is, uh, is ready. We are ready for you. Uh, please join us and uh, you can start uh, your presentation. Thanks for your introduction, Jan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will talk to you about two main things. First of all, a little bit about uh, technology. Uh, this is how these uh, centralized low charge ammonia refrigeration systems are designed and put together. And the second part of the presentation will be about, uh, mainly about the business aspect of things. What, what are the advantages? How low can the energy consumption go? And uh, how about return on investment when investing in a centralized low charge ammonia system? So we have quite a few slides, so some of the slides I'll just go through uh, rather quickly, simply because otherwise I think we're going to run out of time. Uh, here we see some of the, uh, the, the bullet points of centralized low charge ammonia systems. Uh, just, to, just to, as an introduction, uh, the main features are significantly lower energy consumption, significantly lower uh, ammonia inventory, somewhere between three and five times uh, lower than conventional liquid overfeed ammonia systems. There are no ammonia pumps, no ammonia overfeed pumps or ammonia circulation pumps. We don't use superheat control. We control the injection into the evaporators by means of a quality sensor. More about that a little bit later on. And uh, very importantly, all of the suction lines and all of the risers in the system are more or less free of heavy liquid refrigerants or liquefied refrigerants. We're running overfeed uh, or, or vapor content, liquid content in the vapor uh, line coming back to the engine room between one and 5% coming out of the evaporator. So by the time it gets back to the engine room, those liquid droplets have disappeared. So the suction lines and the risers are more or less free of liquid. This is quite important. Now, first of all, let's have a look at a typical installation. This one was completed in 2013 in Perth. Uh, there are about 23 or 24 installations operating in Australia now, and one is in China. What we see here is a 40,000 cubic meter refrigerated warehouse for a food service company. Building exterior is up in the uh, top left hand corner. The plan view is to the right. You see there's a freezer and a chiller, what is called a flower room and an entry room. And the plant room is uh, a little pink uh, rectangle down in the bottom right hand corner. This is uh, a plant that was using uh, superheat controlled injection and evaporators with internal surface enhancement. 25 kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year is the specific energy consumption of this installation. It is still operating. Uh, there has been uh, no real technical issues. Here we see a, a picture of the valve station used for the freezers. Uh, it's uh, no real surprises here. You can see it is all quite conventional. The, the main differences are these. There is a, an oil drain from uh, the distributor, the liquid distributor at the inlet evaporator. Uh, there's uh, two 
hot gas solenoid valves, one for the condensate tray and one for the coil. Uh, the reason for that is uh, to be able to warm up uh, the condensate tray before hot gas is injected into the evaporator coil. These evaporators defrost rather quickly, and if the uh, condensate tray is not warm by the time the condensate uh, starts to hit the tray, there's a risk that it might refreeze. I haven't shown you the way the condensate is returned, but it is returned via a, a high-pressure float valve directly back to the intercooler, not the low temperature accumulator, but the intercooler. Here we see a, um, a, a couple of images of how the liquid is distributed in the evaporator. Uh, this is done in these types of plants, predominantly with what we call gravity distributors. Uh, Kuba in Germany had a patent on on gravity distributors about 40 years ago or more. It has long since expired. What you see on the left there is another type of gravity distributor that comes from the US. Uh, some people call it a tank distributor. And on the left-hand side, uh, you see a coil being pressure tested. It uh, is fitted with another type of uh, gravity distributor. It basically looks like a bucket uh, with, with a distributor lead coming out of the bottom. The advantage of a gravity distributor is that they will ensure uniform distribution over a very wide operating range from about 0 to 700 percent, whereas conventional distributors have a much narrower operating range, somewhere between 50 and 140 percent or so. Outside those operating ranges, or that operating range, liquid distribution, certainly at the lower end, has the tendency to become non-uniform. And at the upper end, uh, there's simply not enough liquid going through uh, to satisfy the evaporator requirement. I may have mentioned before that uh, we do not control the refrigerant injection into the evaporator by means of superheat control. We use uh, some sensors that are able to uh, measure the X value or the quality value of the vapor leaving the, the, refret, the evaporator and um, convert the, the quality signal to uh, a signal that we can feed into the centralized control system, a four to, milli, four to 20 milliamp signal. Uh, it, it, let's not get into too much detail about how this sensor works. Um, this is frankly a matter for the manufacturer these things come from Denmark from a company called HB Products. Uh, what you see there on the on the shot on the left, sorry, on the right, is one way of installing the sensor. There are other ways. Uh, some of the later plants, we have removed the sensor from the refrigerated space and up into the ceiling space, where it's much easier to service. And it doesn't jeopardize the ability to control uh, the refrigerant injection into the evaporator. It's very important that um, the sensor is not submerged into liquid. If it gets submerged into liquid, it has a tendency to, um, uh, it has a tendency to um, send a, a signal that the control system can't read. In those uh, situations, we switch to uh, superheat control until the quality sensor has found its way again and then we switch back to quality control of the injection. So this, uh, this screenshot here is from a, a SCADA system uh, of a plant that was installed approximately five years ago. And what is important and interesting here is when we compare the, the superheat signal with the quality signal uh, leaving the evaporator, the superheat signal you can see uh, down the bottom there, the green signal, and the quality signal is the top signal called X out. You can see we can have wet suction at the same time as we have positive superheat. And this is a peculiarity we observe in almost all the systems that have been installed. You can also see that the room temperature is quite steady. And you can also see that the expansion valve position, this is the one that is titled TXV, more or less in the middle of the picture to the to the left. Uh, the TXV position 
or the expansion valve position does respond to wet suction. So when X out indicates uh, wet suction, the expansion valve closes. Uh, if this expansion valve was to control in response to the superheat signal, it is highly likely that the operation would be far more erratic and, and hunt far more. So the lesson, the lesson or the takeaway out of this is that uh, using quality control will deliver a more stable uh, control than superheat-based control. Uh, this slide shows a little bit more than oil management. Uh, you can also see a couple of slides there, one down the bottom where the guy is bending over a bit. Um, that shows a dehumidifier, which is used to uh, reduce the impact of uh, infiltration into the cold store. The same in the top right-hand picture. There you see a horizontal air curtain which is used for the same purpose, in, in, in other words, to minimize the amount of infiltration that goes into uh, the, the cold store. This is a very, very high usage cold store. Uh, there's a very large door that is open to an area that is held at about five degrees C. And that uh, large opening is used for picking up product for approximately 15 to 20 minutes per hour. It's very important to minimize infiltration here the tank or the receiver that you see towards the left in the picture is a so-called high-pressure liquid-based oil separation system. Inside that receiver, there is a quiet area where the oil can settle down to the bottom of the tank. And once the uh, refrigerant has been cleaned of oil, it spills over into another uh, tank that is, that is at the very end, the end pointing away from the picture. And from there, liquid is fed to the refrigeration system. The oil content, uh, sorry, turn my phone off. The oil content uh, in the refrigerant that is fed into the refrigeration plant is less, less than one part per million. It is not necessary to use this arrangement on all dry expansion ammonia plants. If uh, one uses a compressor that has low uh, oil care or compressor type that has low oil carryover, uh, it's not necessary to do this. Uh, the cost can be reduced by, by not doing it. What you see in the middle of the picture, this little uh, control column or what looks like a control column, is, is actually measuring the oil reservoir in the bottom of, of what looks like a receiver, the oil separation vessel. And when the oil reaches a certain level in the bottom of the receiver, it is automatically fed back uh, to the compressor sump. Uh, so this is also an automatic oil return system, which uh, eliminates oil drainage uh, from the ammonia system as such. Now, this is quite an important uh, graph. We can get into more detail later. You can see the graph is quite busy. What we have here on the uh, vertical axis is the specific energy consumption in kilowatt hours per cubic metre refrigerated volume per year. And along the horizontal axis, we have the refrigerated volume of the warehouse. What is interesting here is uh, are the green dots. These represent centralised low charge ammonia refrigeration systems. And you can see that they're not only much lower than the other uh, print uh, dots in the picture. They are also uh, forming a much tighter cluster around that curve, which is sort of which you might call uh, best practice. The, the, the blue dots, they come from a, an ASHRAE publication, NO 2018, a Guide for Sustainable Refrigerated Facilities and Refrigeration Systems. They come from uh, Dr. Dr. Rindel, uh, Douglas Rindel of, from University of Wisconsin and uh, Todd Jekyll. Uh, they investigated 10 uh, industrial refrigeration plants with liquid overfeed in the States. And the energy performance of those plants uh, is represented by uh, the blue dots in the picture. There are a couple of um, uh, bad ammonia refrigeration plant, the red dot in the top of the picture is a, 
uh, centralized uh, flooded ammonia refrigeration system uh, with economized uh, single stage screw compressors. So it's not very surprising that that plant performs quite badly. And um, later on, I'll show you some transcritical CO2 systems, uh, which are not as bad as the red dot in the picture, but they are much worse than the centralized low charge ammonia systems. Uh, this is a, an image from a plant in South Australia that was installed about five years ago. You can uh, read the data there yourself. Um, this uh, plant has an inventory that's approximately four or five times uh, lower than the equivalent liquid overfeed system. It uses reciprocating compressors and it uses glycol, reticulated glycol for the medium temperature service. This is one of the reasons that the inventory in this plant is relatively low at 200 kilos. Again, this is a refrigerated warehouse that is approximately 40,000 cubic meters in volume. And again, it's a uh, food service business. Um, but what you can see in the background behind the compressors uh, is the vessel unit. And on the right hand side in the picture, you can see a a more detailed picture of the vessel unit with the plate heat exchanger. That's the blue thing there um, below the, the, the intercooler and the low temperature separator. And the frosted up thing in the foreground is the oil uh, drain vessel that separates or that takes the oil out of the two vessels you can see above. So what I've shown you so far and, and what is new here is a reduction in ammonia inventory by about four or five times compared with liquid overfeed systems. What I haven't explained to you is uh, the very much lower inventory in the evaporators. We are looking at somewhere between 30 and 50 times lower than conventional uh, liquid overfeed evaporators for freezer, for freeze applications. Because the density of the ammonia is higher at medium temperature, the reduction in inventory for chill evaporators is not quite that dramatic, uh, somewhere around 20 times lower than conventional liquid overfeed evaporators. Now, if we have a typical freezer with, uh, say, three evaporators, and we lose the operating charge of one of those three evaporators, it is highly unlikely that the ammonia concentration will exceed 100 parts per million if uh, the mixture is fully is fully mixed. Now this is on on the proviso that the supply of ammonia to the evaporator is terminated immediately upon detection of the leak. And it is also assuming that uh, the air refrigerant mixture in the warehouse is completely mixed. Now the ideal H value of ammonia is about 300 parts per million. There are some moves to raise that to uh, 500 parts per million. So we will be significantly lower than the ideal H value uh, if we have a, a low temperature ammonia system and, and if we should be unlucky enough to experience a leak. Ideal H stands for immediate danger to life and health. The uh, specific energy consumption values, there'll be more, so be more to say about that later, are typically um, half of conventional plants. In some cases, it's not quite that dramatic. Sometimes it's only 1.4 times lower, and there are instances where it is 10 times lower if the liquid overfeed plant is uh, very poorly designed or operates. Uh, extensively in part load or both. Uh, I think I mentioned that we are operating at uh, exit values or X values at the exit of the evaporator of approximately 0.95 to 0.99. This equates to 5 to 1% uh, liquid in the vapor leaving the evaporator. So it's just, uh, I don't think I've explained uh, all that much about the evaporator tubes and how important it is to pick the correct evaporator tubes. 
there are a couple of manufacturers in the world uh, who are able to deliver uh, stainless steel aluminium evaporators with internal uh, enhancement in the tubes themselves. It is possible to make the plant work with smooth tubes uh, without uh, internal surface enhancement. But uh, I would uh, recommend uh, against using material with a relatively poor thermal conductivity it is possible to make it work with galvanized steel evaporators and smooth internal surfaces. And it is uh, very possible to make the plant, sorry, the evaporator work with smooth aluminium tubes. Aluminium has a thermal conductivity that is approximately uh, 10 times higher than um, stainless steel. And that is an important uh, factor. This was in, established in, in 2008 by a gentleman by the name Dermot Cotter uh, who now works for Star Refrigeration in Glasgow. He did his PhD and was able to record uh, the behaviour of boiling ammonia uh, as a function of the thermal conductivity of a core tube material. We discussed the uh, tank distributors. Interconnecting pipelines within the plant, uh, these days it is customary to use uh, 304 stainless steel uh, tubes for the interconnecting pipelines within the plant, so those pipes that interconnect uh, compressors, vessels, condensers, etc. These have a uh, an absolute uh, roughness, which is measured in metres, that is somewhere between 20 and 40 times lower than it is for carbon steel tubes. So this gives rise to a significantly lower pressure drop. Now that significantly lower pressure drop does not translate into a, a great uh, improvement in energy efficiency, probably somewhere between two and four percent. But the energy efficiency improvement in these types of plant is not one big thing. It's a matter of combining a lot of little things to a big achievement at the end. Minimization of infiltration, we've discussed that. These plants have variable frequency drives on more or less everything except the spray pump on the evaporative condenser, which is uh, not speed controlled for obvious reasons. Mainly, we use uh, reciprocating compressors. On some uh, very large installations, we use uh, screw compressors for uh, the low temperature side, in other words, for booster operation. Uh, Currently, a 250,000 cubic metre coal store is being constructed here in Australia in Melbourne. And uh, that system uses uh, two quite large booster screw compressors. And uh, finally, it is possible to operate with minus 21 degrees C freezer temperature and minus 25 degrees C saturated suction temperature at the compressors. Uh, this leads to... Uh, uh, very, very good energy efficiency because of the um, low temperature difference between compressor saturated suction and uh, room temperature. And I'll just uh, conclude this part of the presentation with a couple of uh, installation images. Uh, importantly here in the top uh, right hand corner you see how a quality sensor is fitted into a suction pipe. Uh, the other ones are compressor images, you really cannot see the difference between uh, these compressor images and uh, those compressor images you find in conventional liquid overfeed plant. Uh, now, I won't say too much about this uh, other than um, we, we are able to now uh, procure dry expansion chill and tube heat exchangers. They are very handy and very convenient for installation in, in ceiling spaces uh, and they can then provide chilled glycol for process rooms immediately underneath the ceiling space, space where the cell and tube heat exchangers is installed. On the bottom uh, left hand image you see a dry expansion uh, plate heat exchanger. We have installed one such plate heat exchanger with uh, mixed results, uh, but there's no time to get into that 
into in, into that in detail. It, it works, but under operating conditions that I personally found surprising, and under opera, under operating conditions, it doesn't work quite as well. Just a couple of pictures here of a uh, a dry expansion uh, plate freezer. Uh, there. A patent is in is in existence in Australia and New Zealand. We are not the holders of the patent. Someone from the US is the patent holder. The other image you see to the to the left is uh, the so-called low gas defrost system. This is a patent that we hold. It basically uses the heat from the subfloor heating system to defrost the freeze evaporators. So this eliminates any uh, liquid hammer associated with hot gas defrost. Now, I don't have time to get into more detail than that, so we'll just move on. Uh, I think we'll just skip this and get into the next section, otherwise we're just going to run out of time. Now, this is the uh, the business part, if you like, of the, of the presentation. Now, for those of you who didn't quite uh, follow what I was saying before about specific energy consumption, I'll just explain here what that means. So if you imagine you're a coal store operator and you know what the annual energy consumption of the coal store is, either from the utility or from the SCADA system, you take that annual energy consumption of the ammonia plant measured in kilowatt hours and you divide that by the refrigerated volume in cubic metres. That way you get the specific energy consumption in kilowatt hours per cubic metre per year. This is a very widely used metric for comparing uh, the energy efficiency of refrigerated warehouses without blast freezing. So what I'll be showing you in the following is for mixed warehouses, this means a warehouse comprising freezers and chillers, not chillers only and not freezers only, but a mixture of the two. And I won't be uh, getting into too much theory uh, the focus will be on practical installations and recorded values of recorded SEC values. Now here we see uh, an expanded version of the picture I showed you before. I'll, I'll just explain to you once again. The vertical axis are the SEC values. I'm sure you cannot see the numbers clearly, but up here at the top we have 140 kilowatt hours per cubic meter per year, and down the bottom we have zero. And to the right-hand side in the picture, we have 400,000 cubic metres of warehouse volume. And what I've attempted to do here is draw two graphs. The graph in the middle, this is the blue one, is what I call uh, average practice. You can see it there. And the next graph down uh, is what I have called best practice here. Now, the best practice graph is simply a polynomial regression analysis through some recorded SEC values for centralized low charge ammonia systems. The average practice is a polynomial regression analysis through some other numbers, other SEC values for conventional liquid overfeed systems. Okay. And then I've taken a, a really bad system here, uh, more or less in the middle of the picture, and compared that with a very good system down the bottom of, of, of the picture. And you can see there that the difference in specific energy consumption or SEC value <coughs> is a factor of eight. And this is at the high end of what is normally seen in practice. Normally, uh, the difference between best practice and average practice is in the order of between 1.4 and four times. Now, this is, uh, again, uh, an unusual practice here. That little green star down the bottom of the picture there, the bottom meaning the bottom uh, left-hand side, you see a little green star there. This is a, an installation that was put in in uh, May last year here in Australia. And uh, I call that super practice because that installation is 44, 40 to 45%, let's say that, 
below what I call best practice here. Admittedly, uh, this gentleman is very good at managing his colds or he's good at closing doors, but it is nevertheless uh, quite an achievement, uh, much, much lower than what up until now I personally call best practice. So in terms of energy conservation potential, and this is taking a, uh, shall we say, a big macro look at the global uh, refrigerated warehouse industry, if we take a 100,000 cubic meter cold store and we take the difference between average practice and best practice, we see a difference of a factor of four. And uh, this is representative of the energy conservation potential that we have in the refrigerated warehouse industry as a broad average globally today. In Australia, for example, more than 90% of the existing refrigerated warehouses, and we have more than 100,000 refrigerated warehouses in Australia, do not meet best practice. We know this. Here's a financial viability example. Uh, what this is, is it's meant to illustrate uh, how big the difference is in money between an average practice warehouse and a best practice warehouse. So typically, the refrigeration system for a warehouse like that costs $3 million in Australia. Best practice energy consumption is about 1,500 megawatt hours a year. Average practice energy consumption is about 5,500 megawatt hours per year. And that difference is money is about $800,000 a year. Now, this is based on an electricity price of about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, $200 per megawatt hour. And if you divide uh, 800,000 into 3 million, you get about three, four years. Now, even if you were paying less than that, like let's say $100 per megawatt hour, it is still a lot of money and it would still provide a reasonable return to pick a high energy efficiency refrigeration system because it frankly does not cost a lot more than a conventional liquid overfeed system. So is, is a conventional plant worth keeping? Well, personally, I think not. This is another real life example. Uh, this is actually a replacement. You've seen this graph before in the beginning. This is a single stage economized screw compressor plant, which costs nearly $400,000 a year to run. You can see how the figures are made up there. A replacement plant, which is a centralized low charge ammonia plant, will cost 1.2 million. And that plant has got annual operating cost of $115,000 a year. We know this because this client already has a plant like that. And this is what I've circled in a uh, yellow circle, more or less in the middle of that graph. Okay, the graph to the left in the picture. So the, the, the client goes into this with open eyes. He knows what he's going to get when he replaces the plant, and he knows that his payback will be less than five years. Now, here's another example. This is the replacement of an, H, an HFC 404A system. Here you see pictures of the 404A installation as it was. It's a very small facility, approximately 3,200 cubic meters of refrigerated volume. It's a food service business. The Freon plant had been lying dormant for a couple of years. Uh, you can sort of see that in the right-hand picture. It looks decidedly unused. This was uh, replaced with a new dry expansion ammonia plant that was pre-assembled in the workshop. You can see on the, right, the left-hand side there, you see the prefabricated plant room. The ammonia inventory is, is quite a bit less than 250 kilos. On the right hand side, you see the evaporative condenser. And this reduced the SEC value from 206 to 68 kilowatt hours per cubic, uh, cubic meters per year. Now, the 206 uh, value uh, is recorded or was recorded over five years prior to the Freon plant being uh, shut down. So that value is quite real. And the 68 kilowatt hour per cubic meter value was recorded over a number of months with the SCADA system for the ammonia plant. At the same time that the plant was converted from 
ammonia, uh, from Freon to ammonia, it was also expanded by 40% to approximately 5,300 cubic metres. Yet the reduction in the monthly electricity bill for the customer was $10,000. Now, interestingly, that reduction uh, in electricity cost per month is enough to pay the instalments on a commercial loan over 10 years at 5% per annum to finance the purchase of the new plant. Now, what this means is that uh, the investment is, is, is um, cash flow positive from day one. In other words, he can save money, the, the client can save money from day one, but it will require the client to have a healthy balance sheet so that he can go to the bank and borrow the money. So here's a, uh, another uh, real life example. Uh, to my knowledge, this is uh, perhaps the first time this has been established. So what we see here is uh, two uh, refrigeration systems that are conceptually identical both systems have four reciprocating compressors in, in two-stage mode, um, two low and two high. Uh, the, this plant uh, that you see here where the, the, the number 22 is, uh, this is a 22,000 cubic metre warehouse that was installed approximately 10 years ago for a transport company here in Brisbane. Uh, that plant used 1.4 times best practice. The SEC value was... 1.4 times best practice. This gentleman uh, disposed of that plant and bought a new plant with uh, a refrigerated volume of 44,000 cubic meters. That's the blue cross there. And that new plant, which as I said before, is conceptually identical to the old plant, uses 0.97 times best practice. The only difference between the two plants is that the old plant was liquid overfeed and the new plant is dry expansion. So the effect we see there is a 1.3 times reduction in SEC value and that is caused by the elimination of heavy liquid in the suction line network of the plant. Here you see uh, some images of the, the new plant, uh, the four compressors, in the bottom right hand of the picture, the SCADA system uh, on the bottom left hand side and some pipe work and some valve stations, etc. Now the ammonia inventory in this case is uh, 350 kilos because it is all ammonia. We don't have a glycol loop for the medium temperature. It's all ammonia dry expansion. So the inventory is a little bit higher than the plant I showed you before where we had a glycol loop for medium temperature. Now, I think I'm just about running out of time, so I'll just go through this quickly. All these red dots, they represent uh, SEC values from a major cold store chain in the US. And just for fun, I have drawn the little green, green star from before. And you can see the green star occupies a very lonely place in the bottom, uh, bottom left-hand side of this graph. Again, the graph shows SEC values on the vertical axis and refrigerated volumes on, on the horizontal axis. And that difference in my mind is, uh, is quite staggering. Now that plant is installed. This is the Green Star plant. Uh, this shows an image of the Green Star plant. It is a packaged engine room again on the right. And uh, the operator basically installed a, a PIR panel box inside an existing shed and the shed you can see there and in an aerial photo. And the final real life example is a chap who consolidated three Freon based facilities into one and reduced his electricity bill from very close to a million dollars to $500,000 a year, while at the same time uh, having a significant increase in refrigerated volume the ammonia inventory is uh, 472 kilos for 60,000 cubic meters of refrigerated volume. The 500 kilos is a threshold in Australia. Uh, if uh, the facility has more than 500 kilos of ammonia inventory, it is classified as a dangerous goods 
storage facility, which means uh, it it is subject to uh, additional compliance requirements that cost additional money. This is cold lake air distribution, but I don't have time to get into that in detail. So just one open question. Why are we not designing for best practice energy performance? It is in the best interest of all stakeholders. Why is it not common practice? I'll leave that question with you. Why is there no best practice energy performance benchmarking? There is uh, that sort of benchmarking in some countries, but they're few or far between. We don't have it in Australia. What is the capital cost difference between best practice and average practice? No more than 15% in my experience between a uh, liquid overfeed system and a centralised low charge ammonia system. So that 15% has a very quick return on investment. And what proportion of the total life cycle cost of a refrigeration plant does the capital cost of the system represent? If you don't know the answer to that question, I'll volunteer the answer here. It is approximately 10%. In other words, the cumulative operating cost of a refrigeration plant is 10 times higher than the initial capital cost. Yet in, in the vast majority of cases, the, the buying decision is based on the capital cost of the system and not the cumulative operating cost, a life cycle cost. And why is it oft, often the entity that understands the least about the refrigeration technologies that get to make the decision about what technologies are to be applied? Now, this is, a, 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 this is really a strange question. In, in the vast majority of cases, in Australia anyway, this is what happens in practice. And uh, I'll just leave you with that question. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, Devon has promised to handle those. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Please stay on. Uh, we will ask a couple of questions. Uh, the, the summary of your presentation basically highlights all the important points. And I believe the fourth question that you have listed provides the answer to the first. Why is it not happening? Why is the energy best practice not the commonplace? Is it because of the initial cost of the plant is really the only, or one of the only, or one of the key decisive factors when making a decision about technology being deployed? Or what's really holding this back? I think there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there's a, there's a lack of awareness about how different or how big the difference in SEC value can be between one plant and the next. Uh, the other element, of course, is that in many uh, projects where we have the interaction between a developer and a builder who builds the facility and a refrigeration contractor, the builder typically takes the decision on the basis of the lowest capital cost. So if uh, a conventional centralized ammonia plant with liquid overfeed happens to have the lowest capital cost and nothing else is said about what kind of plant the client who pays the electricity bills wants, then the builder will accept the lowest offer and that lowest offer can very well be the plant that delivers the highest life cycle cost. The third aspect, and I haven't really discussed that in detail, is that it is very difficult to model the, the energy performance of liquid overfeed systems. And that is because currently there is no correlation that will predict uh, the pressure drop in wet risers when those risers are in flow reversal. Now, what this means is that when the riser, the wet riser in the suction line uh, reaches what we call a Kutatalatsa number below 3.2, then it is characterized by flow reversal, and there's no correlation that will predict the pressure drop at that point. The more oversized the riser is, the worse the pressure drop in the riser will be, and the higher the penalty in the plant room will be. The, the wet riser pressure drop can be anything up to 60 times greater than the pressure drop uh, in a riser that carries uh, vapor only. 
Stefan, thank you. We have a couple of questions from the audience. I will try to go through several of them, if I may ask for a brief answer. The first question is from Mark uh, Gatako from GNQ, and the question is, is there a difference on the maintenance cost between the low inventory NH3 uh, refrigeration system and the pumped ammonia refrigeration system? Now, this is, this is me as a contractor, and, and not everyone has the same experience. Uh, we are now only servicing centralized low charge plants every two months. We used to service them once a month. We don't anymore. The annual maintenance cost is in the order of uh, one and a half to two percent of the initial capital cost of the system for an average size DX ammonia system, and that excludes water treatment costs. Uh, for liquid overfeed plants, we find that the maintenance costs are somewhat higher one and a half times to two times higher than it is for centralized low charge ammonia plants. We have we simply have more call outs on liquid overfeed systems. Thank you, Stefan. Next question uh, by Anshu Kumar, UNICEF. Uh, what is the minimum plant capacity with ammonia? The one I showed you, what I think it was real, real life example number three. That one there is borderline. Uh, 5,000 cubic meters of refrigerated volume, 50 kilowatts low temperature capacity, 50 ki uh, kilowatt medium temperature capacity, any lower than that, and transcritical CO2 with adiabatic assistant, assistance will be uh, more competitive even over uh, a life cycle of 15 years. Thank you, Stefan. And, and final question. Uh, we know that you have a project uh, currently under under construction or maybe being commissioned in Malaysia. Can you tell us uh, in brief what's the status of this uh, first uh, deployment in Southeast Asia? And the second part of this question is, are you open for business in Philippines if there is an interest for this technology? Well, first of all, on the Malaysian project, we had a lot of setbacks because of COVID. The plant has been pressure tested and leak tested. And then it was discovered that uh, the monkeys have gotten into the cables. So there are some cables that need to be replaced before we can actually get on with, uh, with commissioning. Uh, as to whether we are open for business uh, in, in the Philippines or in Asia generally, not until we are over this COVID uh, situation, unfortunately, it is simply uh, too difficult. We are banned from traveling anywhere from Australia, uh, we need special permits from the government and, and what have you. And there are no flights, and the flights are just too expensive, so it is just too hard at the moment. That's just the sad state of affairs. That's the reality. Uh, and, and the monkeys in, 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 in Malaysia, very interesting uh, challenge to the uh, low-charge ammonia system. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for sharing all this uh, information and the best practice with the industry. Uh, I think it was fantastic. We have several more very technical questions that we will share with you uh, over email, if, if you may uh, find a little bit of time to, to provide answers uh, as we go. So, Stefan, thank you again very much. It was uh, very good to have you here. Thank you. See you later. See you later.